Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching the trial of Charles I by Historia Civilis. So, last time we saw the build-up to this trial, as the radicals who had fought against Charles in the English Civil War tried to establish some legal basis upon which they could charge him. Now, it seems like they weren't really getting anywhere, but I suppose we'll see what happens in this video. If you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon, which is linked down below, and through which you can get access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. On January 20th, 1649, Charles I, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. As Historia Civilis put it last time, separately, but also simultaneously, a man with a lot of power who tried to rule absolutely without the help of Parliament. This is where it's brought up. ...appeared before the English High Court of Justice. Hours earlier, he had been officially charged with tyranny, treason, and murder. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's not good for him. Guess we'll see how this trial goes. Oliver Cromwell watched from a window as the mm. king approached the Palace of Westminster under armed guard. According and as we saw last time, Fairfax was kind of the main man in charge. But as this whole situation got increasingly radical, Fairfax sort of took a step back and was supplanted by Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell is now the main man. If you want to find anybody who's in charge, it would be Cromwell. According to people in the room, when Cromwell saw the king, he went white as a wall. <laughs> he then went over to Lord President John Bradshaw, the guy who would be running the trial, and mm. urgently whispered something in his ear. After a minute, Cromwell rose and addressed the larger group. My masters, he has come, he has come. I desire you to let us resolve here what answer we shall give to the king when he comes before us. Hey, it feels like y'all should have discussed that a little bit earlier. I mean, you're just seeing him out the window, and you're like, Oh, uh, quickly, let's discuss what we're gonna say. Maybe you could have talked about that a little earlier. <laughs> For the first question he will ask us will be, By what authority and commission do we try him? Yeah. Under what authority did they put the king on trial? And, I mean, this is really the big question. Under what authority can they charge the king with treason? Right? And if we're looking at it on a legal basis, there really is no authority in this case, which is why I said last time, I honestly think that these radicals, these revolutionaries, should just leave legality behind, because it's not going to get them anywhere. They have no legal basis to charge the king, and they certainly have no legal basis to charge him with treason. You know, treason is taking up arms against the king. So if they're going to try and make a legal basis, which they very well might, based on what we saw last time, and also the sort of legalistic English culture, I'm not sure they're going to get anywhere. The true answer was that it all came from the House of Commons, who had unilaterally and illegally declared its <laughs> right. own supremacy. In other words... So, sure, if you're judging it based on that, then that's fine. But as Historia Seville has pointed out, they unilaterally and illegally de declared their own supremacy. So there's still not much of a basis of legality there. Now, if you want to establish the supremacy of the commons outside of the basis of law and use that as your legitimacy, then you might be able to do that. Though, I think people are going to have a lot of questions. Um, they probably won't accept that legitimacy. But you definitely can't do that within the bounds of English law, at least not in this case. Their legal authority was thin. Everybody yeah. knew this. For a time, the room was filled with an embarrassed silence. What on earth would they say to the king? One of the commissioners named Martin spoke up. In the mm. name of the commons and parliament assembled and all the good people of England. All right, it was Martin. a weak answer, but at least <laughs> it was an answer. They'd go with that. Yeah. I mean, it's probably the best answer they're going to get <laughs> if they really want to put him on trial. They're probably not going to get much of a better answer than that. The full High Court of Justice entered Westminster Hall, where they awaited the king. Lord President Bradshaw took center stage. He feared assassination, and so he wore on his head a giant bulletproof hat. <laughs> 
even his allies <laughs> thought he looked ridiculous. I mean, yeah, it's probably a silly sight, though, given the violence and civil chaos that England has been embroiled in for years, maybe it's not so ridiculous, right? King Charles entered the hall and Ooh. took his place before the tribunal. Before the trial began, a complete list of the members of the tribunal was entered onto the record. Several seats were empty. When Lord Fairfax's name was called, the commander-in-chief of the parliamentarian army, a voice rang out from the gallery. He has more wit than to be here. It was wow. the Lady Fairfax, his wife. Oh! Wyatt. <laughs> Yeah, that is quite a thing to say. You are going to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> this outburst was cause for concern within the tribunal, most of whom had served under Lord Fairfax during the Civil War. Yeah, I mean, look, we saw last time how Fairfax had, well, you could frame it as either he took a step back or he had been sidelined by the more radical members here. But with him not even being there at all and his wife calling that out, that's very concerning. Uh, you also have to ask the question, did he tell her to say that? Is that a reflection of how he feels, or did she do that completely on her own? It seems like probably he feels at least somewhat like that, especially given that he's not there. So, you know, you might start to get a little bit worried if you're in attendance here. Was he trying to send them a message, or was the Lady Fairfax speaking for herself? Right. Unclear. Either way, nobody dared to remove the commander-in-chief's wife. <laughs> After an awkward silence, Lord President Bradshaw moved things along. Okay. He opened up... I'm real curious to see how they go through with this, because my base of reference is an event that happens, you know, roughly 130 or so years afterwards, 140, 150... I'm talking about the French Revolution. This is something I know a little bit more about. And the French revolutionaries uh, and Louis XVI himself knew the history of the English Civil War. They looked back on events like this and they tried to learn from them. Now, <laughs> you could say Louis was not that successful. Uh, maybe <laughs> he didn't do a, a great job of learning from the events that we're seeing transpire here. But when we look at the execution of Louis XVI, you know, what did the French revolutionaries do? Well, they took a vote and sliced his head off. That simple. Here, and remember, this comes more than 100 years before, they're doing it a little bit differently. They're trying to hold a trial. Um, a trial based on some sort of legitimacy or some sort of legality in order to charge the king. A different way of going about it. If it goes well, perhaps you could argue, well, it has more legitimacy than a simple vote of the legislature. True. But there's also a much larger opportunity for it to go badly. Because, really, under what legal authority are you operating? So, I'm very curious to see how exactly this plays out. Obviously, <laughs> I'm familiar with the, the general conflict, what exactly ends up happening to Charles, but the details... I'm interested to see. Up proceedings with a long speech about how this court was acting on behalf of God, justice, the House of Commons, the people, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. He then instructed mm -hmm. the Solicitor General, John Cook, the lead prosecutor, to begin reading the charges against the king. Charles had something else in mind. Hmm. When John Cook began reading, the king lightly tapped him with his cane <laughs> and indicated that he would like to speak. Oh, Cook my. ignored him and went back to reading the charges. The king was baffled by this and tapped him even harder, causing the silver hilt on his cane to fall off and hit the ground with a loud bang. This would have sounded like a musket shot, and it scared the living hell out of everybody. The entire room looked at the king as... What a way to start, eh? <laughs> also, it must have been more than a, a light tap to cause the top of his cane to fall off. Uh, also, what an incredibly kingly way of going about it. Uh, and very typical of Charles himself. You can imagine him sitting there bewildered as they begin reading the charges. As he, you know, takes his cane and, you know, tap, tap, tap. Excuse me! <laughs> I would like to have my say now. <laughs> as he bent down to retrieve his little ornament. The fact that nobody moved to help him was significant. Ah, uh, well, that is very true. That is very true. Charles bending down to pick up his own little ornament 
you know, if this was a time prior to the English Civil War, if he was being treated as a king of England would usually be treated, the second he dropped something or something he was holding broke, you know, a hundred different attendants would sprint forward to pick it up and give it to him, kneel, you know, your majesty this, your majesty that. The fact that this is such a tense environment and they regard Charles so differently than they might have a couple of years ago is very evident from this small interaction. At his last humiliation of the day, mm. Solicitor General John Cook went back to reading the charges, which concluded by condemning the king as a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and a public and implacable enemy of the Commonwealth of England. Wow. At I mean, certainly a tyrant and a murderer, but uh, you might have a hard time legally proving he's a traitor. Traitor to what? To himself? I mean, he is the King of England after all. He embodies the government of the country. So how on earth could he be a traitor? This, Charles let out a quick burst of laughter. <laughs> a traitor? A traitor against what? Oh, yep, himself? exactly. These charges made no sense. Lord President Bradshaw asked the King how he pled. Was he guilty, or did he maintain his innocence? Hmm. The king responded, There are many unlawful authorities in this world. <laughs> thieves and robbers by the highway. <laughs> but I would know by what uh, lawful authority you go. I was brought here. This is exactly what Cromwell had feared. It was yep. a simple question, but it contained within it a sharp argument. First, and most importantly, before English law, a king could not be charged with a crime, for any reason, before any court. Everybody in the room knew this. The king wanted the tribunal to explain themselves. Second, even if a king could be charged with a crime, the legislation establishing the tribunal had been rejected by the House of Lords. Mm. So, under what authority was the king on trial today? Yeah. And like I said, if you are somebody who was a believer in the English legal system, um, you believed in the law, whether you liked Charles or not, these would probably be very convincing arguments to you. And though, um, I'm sure there were some radicals who wanted to just damn the law and go on with it anyhow, I think a lot of people in England at this time, a lot of the aristocracy, um, probably a lot of the you know common people as well, had some sort of belief in the law of the country and would have wanted things to proceed legally. And so these would be some pretty convincing arguments to bring forward. It was a legitimate question. This got under Bradshaw's skin. His role as Lord President was not being shown the proper respect. <laughs> he answered in a burst of anger, in the name of the people of England of which you were elected king. This was not the answer that they had all agreed to beforehand. <laughs> Bradshaw had just made a massive blunder. Uh-oh. It also gives us a hint as to how Bradshaw viewed the monarchy. Bradshaw had ties to radical Protestantism. And mm. radical Protestantism... Okay, we're discussing that word election. It seemed a little odd for him to say it. Since at the time, used the word election to mean something that was random, arbitrary, and unearned. Bradshaw huh. was a Republican, and that's how he secretly viewed the monarchy. Random, arbitrary, and unearned. The king pounced at this slip of the tongue. He explained to the court that England had been a hereditary monarchy for a thousand years, and that he, as the heir to that tradition, stood, quote, more for the liberties of my people than any of my pretended judges. Hmm. Therefore, show me by what authority I am seated here, and I will answer it. Charles could smell blood in the water. He hmm. knew that there was no precedent for what the High Court of Justice was doing here today. Clearly, they were just making it up as they went along. Bradshaw again asked the king to enter his plea. The king countered by asking on what legal authority he was brought here today. I'm curious to see how long this goes on for. I think I mentioned last time that Charles I was notoriously stubborn. 
It's really one of his most prominent character traits. I mean, we can see that even before the English Civil War, he refused to call or work with Parliament for years and years and years because he wanted to establish his own absolute monarchy. This was a man who would do things his own way and refuse to consult anybody else, refuse to do things any other way. We've seen that before, we're seeing it here. Um, it would get Charles into trouble a lot of the time, you know? Uh, there's a very convincing argument to be made that at many times throughout his life, if Charles was willing to negotiate and work with other people a little bit more, he wouldn't have gotten himself into this position, or, you know, the English Civil War might not have began in the first place. So, basically, this stubbornness is a very enduring character trait of Charles. This went back and forth for quite a while, with Bradshaw becoming angrier and louder <laughs> and more unhinged. Jeez. Eventually, Charles said to Bradshaw, You have shown no lawful authority to satisfy any reasonable man. Bradshaw shot back. That is your apprehension. We are satisfied, who are your judges. Char yeah, that's not a super strong argument, in my opinion. You know, he's giving him the old, That's your opinion! And then he says, you know, we're satisfied and we're your judges, which seems like a bit of a threat to me. Charles replied, "'Tis not my apprehension, nor yours either, that ought to decide it." Hmm. Lord President Bradshaw was extremely frustrated. He adjourned <laughs> proceedings for the day. They would try again tomorrow. Damn. As Charles was being escorted out of Westminster Hall, people began to chant, "'God save the king!' Yep, and that's the problem here. Whether or not this trial is legal, and it's not, <laughs> what's most important is how it's perceived by the people. Do they feel it's legitimate? Do they believe in this trial? And if Charles can get up there and give convincing arguments um, about the legality and the legitimacy of this trial, arguments that convince the people, then that's really bad news for the English rebels. Because... That means not only do they have um, no legal basis to hold this trial, but they're also going to start losing popular support. And, and this day in particular, I would say this is a win for Charles. Um, he certainly came out looking more reasonable than Bradshaw, at the very least. The soldiers in the courtroom tried to drown this out by shouting over top of them, Justice! It was pandemonium. Hmm... In her book, The English Civil War, A People's History, historian Diane Perkis provides a really good summary of the first day of the trial. She describes Charles's strategy as, quote, both intelligent and stupid. He mm. was displaying bright legal maneuvering, but his recalcitrance was also a tactically dim way uh, of getting everybody's goat. And you know what? I think she's exactly right. Uh, this is bright legal maneuvering. He knows that legally he's in the right. They don't have an argument. He does. Uh, and it seems like he's getting the people in the courtroom at least on his side. But there is some truth to what Bradshaw said, which is, you know, we're satisfied and we're your judges. Now, that is sort of an open threat, not very convincing in a debate, but they hold the power. And so, if Charles is going to keep being stubborn, which I'm sure he is because he's Charles I, then that's going to make Bradshaw and the rest of Parliament, you know, rump Parliament, whatever remains, increasingly more angry. And I imagine increasingly less willing to compromise with Charles. Like I just said, this is one of the issues with Charles, is that he was incredibly stubborn, and he would push to get his own way until it was too late. And so... I very much agree with this. I think Charles's legal arguments are sound, but I also think he's putting himself in far more danger the more he makes them. You know, uh, I think at this point, if Charles was willing to cooperate, he could probably still escape with his head. <laughs> still not a great position to be in. And if he'd been willing to negotiate last time, you know, we saw the negotiations happening. If Charles had been willing to negotiate then, then he might have been able to escape with, you know, an heir on the throne, maybe losing his position, but still retaining a lot of power. So, I think this is a good analysis. She's right. 
Charles was running circles around Bradshaw, but he was yeah. needlessly antagonizing him in the process. Yeah. So far, the whole thing was a mess. On the second day of the trial, Lord President Bradshaw sought to take back the initiative and make sure that everybody recognized the High Court of Justice as a legitimate court of law. All he right. began the day with another lengthy opening statement. He talked about the strong legal authority on display here today, and at the end, he asked Solicitor Jack. Yeah, but what strong legal authority? <laughs> How exactly do you explain that? I'm curious uh, about his exact words. Did he provide some basis for that strong legal authority, or did he simply reassert it? Because if you just assert your strong legal authority, hey, that's great, but it doesn't actually mean anything. General John Cook to, once more, read the charges. When he was finished, Bradshaw again asked the king for his plea. The king calmly asked the High Court of Justice to show him upon yep. what legal authority this trial was being held. Of course. Already they were back in this cul-de-sac. <laughs> the king had clearly been working on his argument overnight, and he said to Bradshaw, this is not my case alone. It is the freedom and liberty of the Ooh, people of England. Very smart. This is very smart. So, Charles has made himself exceedingly unpopular by taking up arms against his own people. Plus, the tyranny even before the beginning of the English Civil War. That's a good way to make people dislike you. But, first off, he's displayed his sharp legal reasoning in the first day of the trial, and so people who even may not like him might be saying, well, Charles is right, what basis does this trial stand on? And now today he's making the argument that, look, you know, I'm not just arguing for myself, I'm arguing for the people of England. You know, you, and he hasn't finished making his point. I'll let him finish making his point, actually. And do you pretend what you will? I stand more for their liberties. For if power without yeah. law may make yep. laws, may alter the fundamental laws of the kingdom, I do not know what subject he is in England that mm -hmm. can be sure of his life or anything he calls his own. Yeah, this is very convincing. So Charles is making the argument that, look, you're violating my liberty, but it's not just my liberty. If you can violate my liberty, you can violate anybody's liberty. If you can arbitrarily make laws like you're doing right now, then is anybody safe? You know, is anybody's lives safe? Is their property safe? Who knows what could happen to them? So this isn't just about me. This is about the people of England. I think this is a pretty intelligent way <laughs> of taking an issue, which is Charles's. He's the one on trial and making it everybody's issue. Uh, and I imagine that if you're someone who maybe it's more in the middle, maybe you haven't fully made up your mind, or maybe you even don't like Charles, but you're unsure about this trial, this would probably be quite a convincing argument. Now, I'm not sure it's actually going to help Charles <laughs> survive this ordeal, but I do think, once again, it's a pretty good argument. The king was trying to pull a switcheroo. The High Court of Justice had claimed to be acting on behalf of the people of England, but yeah. now Charles was trying to position himself as the true champion of liberty. Yeah, he's trying to reframe the narrative. As any good politician could tell you, you know, that's exactly what you have to do to get the people on your side. Now, if you zoom out, this is all pretty ridiculous. Charles, as the true champion of liberty, <laughs> he was a tyrant through and through. He used plenty of arbitrary laws back when he was in charge. So, you know, in reality, of course he's not a champion of liberty. Absolutely ridiculous. But if he can reframe the narrative to make it look like that, then he's going to get some people on his side. He was arguing that if the aristocracy could ignore the rule of law and come after the king himself, nobody in England yep. was safe. This must have been laughable to those who remembered being thrown <laughs> in prison for yeah. refusing to loan the king money, but yep. here we are. Charles had skillfully maneuvered Bradshaw into a corner. Bradshaw interjected, Sir, I must interrupt you. Sir, it seems you are entering on arguments and disputes about the authority of the court before which you are convented as prisoner. 
you may not do it. <laughs> right, Joe was trying to say that questioning the legitimacy of the court mm. was against the rules. Yeah, I think one of the issues here is that not only that Charles has some good points to make, but that Bradshaw has no responses beyond, hey, shut up. You don't have a right to say that. Uh, and it seems like that's partially on Bradshaw. I, I don't think he's the right man for the job, frankly, but it's also, you know, that they are, there are no good answers to Charles's questions. You know, if the parliament, like I said, the remaining parliament, is attempting to act under the guise of legality, then, you know, they're on the same playing field as Charles. They're both confronting the law. And if they're going at it from that angle, then Charles holds all the cards. The House of Commons has no arguments to make for the legality of this trial. Now, if they wanted to abandon that and take it from a different direction, I think... They might have more luck, but I also think that's just a step too far for most people. Um, they would lose a lot of people, especially a lot of moderates in that process. And so they're trying to confront Charles on the legality of the trial, but they have no good answers to the questions he's asking. Kind of weak, if you ask me. The king continued to speak. Something about law and reason. Mm. Bradshaw cut him off again. You speak of laws and reason. It is fit. There should be law and reason. And those are both against you. Really? The vote of the commons of England in Parliament. That is the reason of the kingdom. It is the law of the kingdom. This last bit about the commons being the law of the kingdom was incorrect. Under normal circumstances, the House of Lords and the monarch had to sign off on any new laws. Yeah, well, once again, this is just something that the House of Commons is trying to assert. It's trying to assert the supremacy of the Commons. But that's not actually true. I mean, they can assert it as much as they want. But legally, the House of Commons is not the law of the kingdom. They're pointing out here what the law of the kingdom actually is. The fact that the House of Commons had illegally declared its own supremacy was actually <laughs> right. the central issue here. And reminding everybody of this actually kind of worked in the king's favor. Yeah. It's puzzling why Bradshaw would go down this road. The king tried to interject, but Bradshaw cut him off again. Sir, you are not to dispute our authority. You are told it again by the court. Again, the king tried to speak. Sir, it will be taken notice of you that you stand in contempt of court. Oh. A contempt of court charge was a huge deal at this time. It meant that the trial could proceed without the defendant. Oh, wow. The king replied, I mean, that's probably what the commons wants right now. <laughs> they would rather have this trial without Charles there because he's making some good arguments. And even though we saw at the beginning of this trial, you know, uh, his cane broke and he had to pick it up on his own. Clearly, he's not being treated with the usual respect a king is treated with. But I'm certain that his presence alone is having an effect on the people there. To the Lord President, I do not know how a king can be a delinquent. Continuing later, he said, To demur against any proceedings is legal. Mm. I do demand that. The king was challenging the contempt charge on multiple fronts. He was saying, first, that a king cannot be held in contempt, and second, even if he could, simply asking, why am I here, is perfectly legal. So yeah. far, this is just a bad situation for the House of Commons. Honestly, the trial in the first place was a bad idea. Um, you know, like I said, I think a lot of people are not happy with Charles, right? They're not happy with the English Civil War. This was a period of much violence. But this is sort of taking it a step too far. I think most people would have preferred if Charles the Royalists had been able to come to some sort of compromise, some sort of deal with Parliament, with the House of Commons. Of course, that didn't happen because Charles was unwilling to give up anything in negotiations. And so we end up here, which is bad for the House of Commons because it's making them look really bad. <laughs> you know, they have no real legal basis to hold this trial. And so it's making Charles look good, but it's also bad for Charles because he's going to end up with his head cut off. <laughs> so, you know, this is sort of the situation we're left with. And I'm not really sure it's great for anybody. They had not really answered that question. Let's pause here for a moment. 
The king was behaving as if refusing to enter a plea was some kind of immovable force. <laughs> this wasn't exactly true. Mm. English law had a provision for situations like this. If a defendant refused to enter a plea, the law at the time empowered the court to take the defendant outside and torture them until Whoa. they changed their mind. <laughs> Jeez. For real. King Charles was making a bet here. He was betting that the High Court of Justice wouldn't dare torture the King of England. I mean, I think he's probably right. Uh, you can also see why criminal justice reform became such a big issue about a hundred years later in the Enlightenment. <laughs> At this point, a lot of countries are still using uh, what might be viewed as sort of medieval legal proceedings, including a lot of torture and capital punishment. And so, you know, we fast forward towards the Enlightenment, a lot of these things are still being used, and a lot of enlightened philosophers are writing out against them. Um, and, you know, from this we can see why. But, back to Charles, I think he's probably right that, I mean, maybe not. I guess we'll see throughout this video. I would be very surprised if the House of Commons actually had the nads to take him outside and beat it out of him. I think that would be incredibly unpopular. He was right. They wouldn't dare. Bradshaw and company believed, rightly in my opinion, that any mistreatment of the king would cause public opinion to swing in his favor. Oh yeah. It might even set off a royalist uprising. Way yeah. too risky. Oh yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Like I said, a lot of people are opposed to the king, or at least opposed to what he's done over the past couple of years, but taking the king outside and torturing him, I don't think that's going to go down well with almost anybody. Bradshaw tried a new argument. He told the king that they had put one of his predecessors on trial before, and that had been entirely legitimate. Hmm? Now, I have no idea what Bradshaw is talking about here. Yeah, who? Many kings had been imprisoned or forced to step down, but nothing like this. Not no. a trial. Char no, and that's the point I was making earlier. That's probably what people expected. Charles would be forced to step down, his heir would be placed on the throne, or some agreement would um, be made between Charles and the House of Commons. You know, this is something that had happened in the past. There are lots of examples of kings being imprisoned or forced to step down or all that kind of stuff. This, and one of the issues with this, is that it's completely unprecedented as far as, well, as far as the story of civilists can tell and as far as I know as well. Charles didn't know what he was talking about either. He interrupted Bradshaw. I deny that. I deny it. Show me one precedent. Right. Bradshaw had made an assertion that he couldn't back up. His <laughs> third major blunder. This guy this sucks. <laughs> Sir, you ought not to interrupt while the court is speaking to you. The point of precedent is not to be debated by you. What? Bradshaw was saying with a straight face <laughs> that this court of law was not interested in hearing precedent? What? Yeah, this Bradshaw is so bad. Bradshaw feebly asked again for the king to enter his plea. And again, the king responded that he would be happy to do so once he knew under what authority this trial was being held. And I've said that they should have abandoned legality. You know, if the trial is going this badly, then what is the point of even having the trial? It feels like the House of Commons is really getting nowhere. Bradshaw had had enough and called for the prisoner to be removed. Hmm. But the king had more to say. Ooh. He called out, Wait, I require some time to state my reasons. Bradshaw responded in anger, Sir, it is not for prisoners to <laughs> require. The king replied, Sir, I am not an ordinary prisoner. Yeah. Bradshaw yeah. started shouting again, but Charles talked over him and just started giving his speech. And <laughs> he got to a part where he said that it was, quote, for the liberty, freedom, and laws of my subjects that I ever took up. He stopped himself. Charles had just made a mistake. Oh. He was going to say, took up arms, but this would have been an admission that he had started the Civil War. Yep. He corrected himself. Don't want to admit that, do you, Charles? <laughs> Defended myself with arms. I never ah, took up there arms you go. against the people, but for the laws. That was a close one. At last, the king was taken away under guard. The calls of God save the king and justice followed him out of the room. Jeez. In the commotion. I'm curious what exactly 
uh, the composition of the audience was. Who were they letting into this trial? Was it a first come first serve type of deal? Was it just you know average people off the streets, or was the audience primarily filled with notables, with aristocrats? Because um, that obviously changes what we take away from them. You know, yelling "God save the king." You know, who exactly was in this audience? I'd be curious to know. One of the members of the tribunal, a cobbler named John Hewson, pushed through the crowd and spat in the king's face. Oh. Charles Com Classy, huh? calmly wiped his face clean, telling the cobbler, <laughs> Well, sir, God hath justice in store for you <laughs> and me. Yeah. Finally, certainly. day two of the trial was over. It was a disaster. You wouldn't have thought it possible, but Bradshaw had mucked things up, even yeah. worse than on day one. I mean, you know, maybe they really should remove this guy. Probably looks really bad in the middle of a trial to replace Bradshaw, and that's probably why they're not doing it. And also, they mentioned last time how they had a real hard time finding someone to do the job anyway. So maybe there's no one to replace him, and also it would look bad to replace him, but yikes, he's doing a bad job. King Charles was successfully positioning himself as a champion yeah. of the liberties of the people, yeah. and Bradshaw had failed to stop him. Th I mean, that really shows you how big a failure this trial has been. Charles is positioning himself as a champion of the liberty of the people of England. That is a ridiculous claim if you look at the history of his reign. I mean, just totally nonsensical. But this trial is going so badly for the House of Commons that Charles is able to make that point and have it be relatively convincing in this context. There was no excuse for the trial to be going this badly. Yeah. That evening, Oliver Cromwell and some others met with Bradshaw and urged him to change <laughs> tactics. All right, pep talk. This wasn't working. Bradshaw maybe didn't fully appreciate this, but people were terrified. Nobody knew if this new regime would survive. Members of the tribunal were actually being persuaded by the king's arguments. Ooh. They now feared that the tribunal was not a legitimate court of law. It's Nothing not. Nothing had to change. It's not a legitimate court of law. But of course, as they're pointing out there, what really matters is if people think, if they feel it's legitimate. And that's the real problem, as I pointed out earlier is that with Charles arguing so well and Bradshaw falling apart, people are starting to feel like this isn't legitimate. And legitimacy really turns on popular opinion, or at least the opinion of those who matter, those in power. Day three of the trial began in the old, familiar way. The king was hauled in, and Solicitor General John Cook read the charges. After yet another lengthy speech, Bradshaw asked the king for his plea. Mm. This time, Charles was silent. He appeared to be deep in thought. Finally, he spoke up. When I was here yesterday, I did desire and begin to speak for the liberties of the people of England. Mm -hmm. I was interrupted. I desire to know yet whether I may speak freely or not. <laughs> this was different. Bradshaw yes. was caught off guard. He stumblingly told the king that he could not enter into a discourse at this I think Bradshaw is caught off guard by everything. Time, and that first he must answer the charge laid before him. Oh, here the we king go. He was well prepared. He raised his voice so everybody in the room could hear. We have a, a Groundhog Day type scenario for the king who's reliving the same day over and over again. <laughs> he comes in. You know, they ask him, you know, what do you plead? He says, by what authority do you bring me here? Repeat, repeat, repeat. So he's trying something different, maybe. For the charge, I value it, not a rush. It is the liberties of the people of England I stand for. Mm, playing he to the crowd. He was playing to the crowd now. Uh, yep, Bradshaw yep. was instantly enraged. He rose to his feet and took a few steps towards the king. Whoa, as if things whoa. things were about to get physical. What are you doing? He shouted, truly, sir. Men's intentions ought to be known by their actions. You have written your meaning in bloody characters throughout the whole kingdom. Bradshaw was speaking of the Civil War. I mean, that's true, but Bradshaw is 
Historia Civilis used this word earlier, I thought it was a bit of an exaggeration, but Bradshaw is a bit unhinged, frankly. How dare the king pretend to defend liberty when he had killed tens of thousands of his own people? This is true. The king tried to interject again, but Bradshaw turned and began speaking to the clerk. The king was to be held in contempt of court. Wow. He ended his instructions with the phrase, clerk, do your duty. At this, the king let out a snort and muttered something under his breath. <laughs> Bradshaw turned to the king. You are before a court of justice. The king looked to the row of soldiers behind him. I see before me a power. <laughs> With that, Lord President Bradshaw True. adjourned proceedings and ordered the prisoner removed. Well, that went just as badly as all the other days, but they did finally hold the king in contempt of court, which means, you know, they no longer have to bring him in so he can stop making his damn convincing arguments. As promised, he had changed tactics. The king had been found in contempt of court. Yeah. Under English law at the time, his presence at his own trial was no longer necessary. I mean, it's clear the trial is a total sham. <laughs> But it's probably best for the House of Commons that uh, they don't let Charles come to the trial anymore <laughs> because he's literally convincing people that this whole thing is a sham, which, like I said, it is. Bradshaw and the High Court of Justice would begin hearing evidence without him. Jeez. The Solicitor General, John Cook, was distraught over how the trial was going so far. Yeah. He had always hoped and expected that the king would plead guilty. After this, he had assumed that the tribunal would be merciful and restore either him or his son to the throne. Yeah, and I think at some point that was true. But as we've talked about here, and I think you can sort of understand the point I was making earlier, with Charles being so incredibly stubborn, that he refuses to negotiate at every single step before the Civil War refusing to consult Parliament, then, you know, this war beginning in the first place, then after it ended, refusing to give any concessions in negotiations, and now in this trial, even though he's making good arguments, refusing to uh, play the game that the House of Commons wants him to play, every step of the way, he's sort of radicalizing his opponents to where... You know, what option are they going to have left? I think it's true that what they wanted was Charles to come in, plead guilty, and they would depose him and put his son on the throne, or something like that. But this is going so badly that sort of the course of action, I would imagine, is beginning to change. Instead, the king had just been found in contempt of court. Yeah. It was finally dawning on Cook that this was not going to end well. As he walked home that evening, Cook's mind was full of dark thoughts. Once again, we can think forward to the French revolutionaries. You know, they just voted the king deposed and then held a vote on whether to kill him or not. Now, that second vote was incredibly close. So there was absolutely complexity to that. Uh, that was a far more difficult decision for the French revolutionaries than deposing the king. That one was fairly easy. But executing him, that was more complicated. But even so, once again, they just voted for it and then made it happen. Um, here we can see a different way of doing it. This, the whole rigmarole of the trial, which is going absolutely terribly. A former pupil spotted him across the street and ran over to pick his brain. What's going to happen? What should we expect from the trial? Cook answered, full of bitterness and regret. The king must die, and wow. the monarchy must die with him. Well, there you go. You can see the point that Cook, and I imagine a lot of his peers have reached, after how badly all of this has gone, what they might view as the intransigence of the king. At this point, the king must die, and the monarchy must go with him. Day four. No king this time. On the fourth day of the trial, the High Court of Justice met in the Painted Chamber, a much smaller adjoining room, to hear evidence. The Solicitor General, John Cook, had charged the King with being a tyrant, a traitor, and a murderer. 
Mm. These would be tough charges to prove against the head of state, but fortunately, the king would not be present <laughs> to advocate in his own defense. Yeah. Cook decided to really focus the testimony on whether or not Charles was a traitor. I mean, it's not, it's not, a tra it's a kangaroo court. It's a sham trial. It's not even a trial. They're just holding proceedings to charge the king, right? I mean, that's it. They're laying forth uh, all of the things he's done and then charging him. Um, the king is not there to argue in his own defense. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's there to argue in the king's defense. I don't know if he had any lawyers still in the room or any defenders. Um, I couldn't tell you that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Maybe some of you know, but at this point, what was already a sham trial is basically no longer a trial at all in any meaningful sense of the word. Since it seemed obvious that the questions of tyranny and murder would follow naturally from that. At the time, the traditional definition of the word treason was when somebody took up arms against <laughs> their king. Right. But the House of Commons and the High Court of Justice had gone to great lengths to argue that the state's power emanated not from the king, but from the people. Yeah, so once again, they're making this argument that they're charging Charles because he took up arms against the people of England. This court is operating on the authority of the House of Commons and therefore the people of England. And they're accusing Charles of treason because he took up arms against the people of England. Now that's all nice and dandy. That's fine. That's a fine thing to believe, but there's no basis in law. So whether or not you think this is true, or I mean, he certainly did take up arms against the people of England. That's certainly true, but that's not how the law works. Not in this case. And so if you want to make a legal argument, which the court is still pretending it wants to do, then you can't go with this argument. Think about this. If the king was the embodiment of the state, and the state's power came from the people, then attacking the people was kinda like attacking the king. This was a <laughs> core tenet of popular sovereignty. Yeah. Taking this to its logical conclusion, Solicitor General John Cook believed that all they had to do was prove that the king had taken up arms against his own people. Yeah, well, you can prove Pretty that simple. easily. Cook began bringing forward a steady stream of witnesses to testify against the king. Day five. The next day, the High Court of Justice continued hearing from witnesses in the painted chamber. Again, the king was not present. In the end, 33 people provided testimony. Each told the tribunal that over the course of the Civil War, the king had personally ordered deadly attacks against the English people. Yeah, well, that's not hard to prove. <laughs> if that's what you're trying to prove, then there you go, job done. Of course, the issue is that this whole thing is so much more complicated than that. That was it. In the end, the case was actually quite simple. Yeah. Solicitor General yeah. John Cook believed that since the English people were sovereign, this was enough to prove treason and tyranny. And since these orders had resulted in tens of thousands of deaths. And like I said, this is certainly an argument that we would accept today. Uh, at least most countries would accept this. If a head of state took up arms against their people, we would call them a tyrant and we could accuse them of treason fairly. And they would be able to be charged in a court of law, I think, in a lot of countries. And, frankly, I think that's something that probably a lot of us believe. I'm sure a lot of us believe in popular sovereignty and democracy and all that good stuff. It's just that in this case, with the law of England at this point, it's not really applicable, at least not in a legal sense. It might be applicable in a philosophical or a moral sense, but they're not really making a philosophical or moral argument. They're making a legal argument. So it just doesn't really work. It was also enough to prove murder. The members of the High Court of Justice served as both judges and jury. Among themselves, here in the painted chamber, away from the public, they decided that the king was guilty. Yeah. Oliver Cromwell pulled off with a small group of allies to write up a death sentence. But when, And I think this is really the problem with this whole thing, right? Of course, the trial is a sham, and it certainly didn't help the cause of the House of Commons or the cause of the radicals. But in my opinion, essentially the problem is that, you know, we have the Civil War, negotiations begin between the House of Commons and the King. They don't go anywhere because the King is too stubborn, 
And so everything begins to escalate and escalate and escalate. The radicals gain more power on the side of the House of Commons. You know, things get more radicalized. And we get to a point, this point, where they're now writing up a death sentence for the king and planning to execute him. I think the real problem is that that's way too far for most of the people of England. I think the people absolutely would have accepted some sort of deal between the House of Commons and the king, where, like I said, um, maybe his son keeps the throne and he has to step down. They would have accepted that. But, you know, from that point, they were negotiating over that earlier. Things have just gotten more and more out of control. And now we've reached this point, which most people just simply don't agree with. I think this whole trial is more sort of a symptom of that, though the trial itself went especially badly, as we've seen throughout this video. And Cromwell and friends presented the death sentence to the group. Only 46 of the 135 members agreed to sign it. People Yikes. were afraid. What if the king somehow returned to not even a simple majority power? Anybody who signed this document would be guilty of treason and put to death. Cromwell and his allies stayed late into the evening, making threats, making promises, anything they could think of. Mm. In the end, they went from 46 names to 59 names. 59 was- And it's funny because in the end, after this whole trial, what do we end up with? We end up with a death sentence that they need a at least a majority of the people present to sign. Uh, this is what happens with the French Revolution, you know? They vote um, to end the monarchy establish a republic, force the king to step down, and then they vote on whether to execute him or not to execute him. That's what it comes down to, a simple majority vote, uh, even after this whole trial. ...was still far short of an absolute majority, but the legislation establishing the tribunal had been careful to say that they didn't actually need an absolute majority. <laughs> Some have wow. argued, and I'm inclined to believe this, that 59 was an important benchmark because it represented a majority of those who had actually shown up to the trial. This would be enough to satisfy mm. the public. Not great. Not great. On the sixth day, the High Court of Justice met back in the original hall in Westminster. Today, the king was invited back hey, to his own trial. There he is. When Charles <laughs> entered the room, the soldiers met him with cries of justice and execution. The day's Ugh. proceedings began, as usual, with a long speech from Lord President Bradshaw. Oh, man. The king cut in and asked if he could speak. Bradshaw replied, you may answer in your time. Hear the court first. The king pressed on. It is only a word, a sudden judgment. Bradshaw cut the king off, telling him that he must hear the court first. <laughs> yeah, after the disaster that was the first couple of days of the trial, <laughs> Bradshaw is like, we are not letting you talk again. <laughs> Bradshaw continued to speak, saying, in part, that the king was charged with, quote, treason and other high crimes exhibited against him by the people of England. A woman's voice rang out from the gallery. Oh. It is a lie, not a quarter of them. Another woman joined in. Oliver Cromwell <laughs> is a traitor. Uh oh. It was the Lady Fairfax again. again. This time she had a friend with her. They were both wearing disguises. Orders were given. <laughs> disguises. And soldiers pointed their muskets at the crowd. Whoa, the whoa, room whoa, whoa. Fell into this is getting out of hand quickly. Chaos. The two women escaped in the confusion. Can I just say that wearing a disguise to a trial and then calling one of the judges a traitor is yeah. just so awesome? That's pretty epic. <laughs> wearing a disguise to the trial of the king and calling one of the judges a traitor. My goodness. What a dramatic moment. When order was restored, Bradshaw resumed his speech. He said that the tribunal had already agreed upon a sentence, which would be read momentarily. But if the king would like to make a speech in his own defense, now would be the time. Wow, okay. Bradshaw. We've already agreed on your sentence, but uh, if you want to defend yourself, go ahead now. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, was laying a clever trap. The phrase, in his own defense, oh. was key. If the king laid out a formal legal defense now, it would be an implicit acknowledgement of the legitimacy of the court. Oh. But Charles didn't fall into the trap. He mm. said that he worried not for his own life, but <laughs> rather for his conscience, for his honor, and for the peace of the kingdom. 
Right. If you read between the lines, this was a threat. Charles continued. He had an offer, a compromise. He would agree, here and now, to a formal trial before Parliament. He had never recognized the legitimacy of the High Court of Justice, but they could all recognize the legitimacy of Parliament. They and the thing is, I think it's too little too late. You know, I think if Charles had made that offer a while ago, at this point, a long while ago, it might have been accepted. But at this point, they've gone through all of this. I find it hard to believe that the House of Commons or those who remain, right? Remember, the most radicalized members of the House that remain would accept that deal. You know, everything's gone way too far. There, the king would willingly subject himself to a fair public trial. The members of the tribunal had not anticipated this. The oh. king was finally negotiating. Nobody wanted another civil war. All right, well, maybe they will go for it. Maybe I'm wrong. I felt like it was too little too late, but maybe this olive branch will be accepted. The offer was tempting. But it was a trick. When the king oh. said parliament, he meant both houses of parliament. The House of Commons remained sharply divided over the king's trial. The original vote to establish the tribunal had only been 26 to 20, quite narrow. Mm. On top of this, the House of Lords had always been against it. If there was a trial before the House of Commons and the House of Lords, the chances were pretty good that the king would be found innocent. This was a really clever gambit. It had the appearance of fairness, which was persuasive to those who were on the fence. Yeah. One member of the tribunal, John Downs, spoke up. He had been one of the very last people to sign the king's death warrant, one mm. of the people that Cromwell had threatened late last night. Now, he spoke in favor of the king's request. <laughs> yeah, that's not good for Cromwell, eh? <laughs> you have someone who has literally just signed the king's death warrant. Now, he's been cajoled into doing it, but on paper, he has signed the king's life away, and upon the king extending this olive branch, he's like, you know what? I support this. Let's do it. That shows you how weak the support for executing the king actually was. It also shows you, by the way, another note on Charles, that if he had extended an olive branch, if he had been willing to negotiate, I think, at any point throughout this process, then he probably would have gotten somewhere. There were lots of people willing to accept an olive branch from the king, he just hasn't been willing to offer it until this very last point. Have we hearts of stone? Are we men? The people around him told him to be quiet, <laughs> one whispering that he was putting his own life in danger. Uh -oh. Downs raised his voice. If I would die for it, I must do it. Wow. Cromwell was angry and rushed over to Downs' side, whispering loudly, What do you mean to do? Cannot you be quiet? <laughs> Downs continued, growing even louder. Sir, no, I cannot be quiet. Downs jumped to his feet and wow. continued shouting. Cromwell gave Bradshaw a signal, and the Lord President adjourned the trial. Members of the tribunal retreated to an anteroom. Wow. A half hour later, the trial resumed. Downs's seat was empty. Uh-oh. The king continued making his request for a trial before parliament. When he was done, Bradshaw launched into yet another extremely long speech. He concluded by calling the king a tyrant, a traitor, and a murderer. Mm -hmm. The king realized that Bradshaw was just gonna ignore his request. He cut in. I only desire a word before you give sentence. Bradshaw pressed on. For all which crimes and treasons, this court doth adjudge that he, the said Charles Stuart, is a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and public enemy to the good people of this nation, shall be put to death by the severing of his head from his body. Oh my. Charles tried to speak once more, but he was pulled out of the room. The trial was over. The king had been sentenced to death. Yep. And that is how this all ends.
At the time of the trial of Charles I, there was a tradition in England that went back at least a hundred years that went a little something like this. When the crown and parliament could not agree, the monarchy was tightly constrained by the law. But mm -hmm. when the crown and parliament agreed, the English monarchy was among the most powerful institutions yeah. on earth. Well, this was the issue that Charles faced throughout his reign he wanted to make himself an absolute monarch. Like I said, it was very much his way or the highway, and he refused to work with Parliament. And so, he was very constrained. His power was constrained, which is the opposite of what he wanted, which, of course, only made things worse, as he tried to work around Parliament in a variety of ways, tried to, you know, levy taxes without officially levying taxes. You know, this caused a whole bunch of problems, problems that would eventually snowball into the English Civil War. But, his story civilis is, is exactly right, if the king was able to work with Parliament, if they were on the same page, this was a very powerful system. You know, the crown could really do what it wanted. That's not what happened in the case of Charles. Part of this was propaganda, but it contained within it the seeds of popular sovereignty. Charles I had never agreed with this philosophy. He yep. believed that relying on popular support diminished the powers of the crown. Exactly. As and we talked about this in the first episode, this idea of divine right versus popular sovereignty. Divine right, the idea that you as a monarch are empowered to rule by God and God alone. You don't need any other sources of legitimacy. You don't need popular support. You don't need the support of parliament. You don't need anything versus popular sovereignty. The government rules by the right of the people. The government needs the support of the people to rule. And England, or, you know, later on Britain, had this pretty powerful constitutional monarchy. It really served as one of the examples for a lot of other countries to follow. You know, you have a fairly powerful monarch, but a monarch who is constrained by law and constrained by the parliament, which is this pretty powerful legislative body. Um... There are a lot of other examples, of course, of kings being held back by their aristocracy, but you can see it was really organized quite well in England, and as time goes on, Parliament will get more and more and more powerful, and the monarchy will get less and less and less powerful, until we get to, you know, the present day, where, you know, Britain is still technically a constitutional monarchy, but the monarch has very little power. Um, it acts as a parliamentary democracy. Charles didn't like that at all, <laughs> even at this point in 1600s when the king still had a lot of power. He wanted to do what, say, Louis XIV had done in France. Louis XIV had grown up in a France where the aristocracy held a lot of power over the monarch, and so he cowed the aristocracy. He established his power and his power alone. He was a big believer in divine right and absolute monarchy. Charles wants to do that in England, Scotland, and Ireland. But it's just not going to work, you know? Um, England in particular has this political history, these stronger institutions, this idea of liberty, at least to a certain extent. That's not going to fly in England. And once again, that's how we get to this whole conflict. As a consequence, he had ruled as an authoritarian. But after 11 years under an authoritarian king, the people of England rose up and declared that sovereignty lie not with the crown, but with the people. Yeah. Quite literally a revolutionary idea at the oh, time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. King Charles I was put to death on January 30th, 1649. At his execution, he spoke at length about the proper role of parliament telling the crowd that, quote, a subject and a sovereign are clean, different things. <laughs> that had been true in the past, but now it was no longer the case. Popular sovereignty had come to England, which meant yep. that it was now possible for monarchs to commit crimes against their own people. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. And popular sovereignty would come to most of the rest of the world, uh, in particular, most of the rest of Europe. 
in the following couple hundred years, uh, up until the present day, of course. Popular sovereignty is now a rather popular idea, though still challenged in a lot of places throughout the world. But anyway, back to Charles. Uh, I enjoyed this little mini-series by Historia Civilis, Can Monarchs Commit Crimes and the Trial of Charles I? Uh, this, of course, is a sort of different topic than he usually covers, but I think this was really his major foray into sort of early modern or modern European history. He did these videos, and then later we got the Congress of Vienna videos, which were absolutely fantastic. Um, of course, Historia Civilis has a variety of videos uh, across different time periods, but at this point, I think it's fair to say that he has basically a big chunk of ancient history, especially late Republican Roman history, and then he also now has some modern European history videos with the Congress of Vienna series and these videos. I think he does a terrific job with both of them. So yeah, I had a great time with this series. I hope you guys did. Um, I feel like I've said all I can say <laughs> about the trial of Charles I. Uh, I think the English Civil War is a fascinating conflict. You could call it sort of the English Revolution. Of course, there was the Glorious Revolution to come and blah, blah, blah but it was very revolutionary in many ways. Uh, it's something that I honestly don't know too much about. As I explained last time, I know a bit about it. M my main focus is uh, 18th century European and American history. So this is a bit outside my time period, but when you study the 18th century, uh, and especially if you look at Britain or America, you'll learn some stuff about the English Civil War because you know, the effects of the English Civil War would rever reverberate for many years to come, right? So it's something that uh, I think I'd like to learn more about because it's very, very fascinating. And the ideologies that developed during this conflict, the radicalism, the revolutionary sentiment would be important in the years to come for Britain and its colonies, uh, America in particular. So yeah, I think a uh, really fascinating conflict. Really enjoyed these videos. Uh, if you guys enjoyed them, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe, and once again, check out the Patreon, which is linked down below. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.